Ever since time immemorial, one thing has been certain in the turmoils of European politics. The French can never pass up an opportunity to go into revolt. The specific revolt in question today is the one that brought about the short-lived but very influential Paris Commune in 1871. Before we jump right into it though, some groundwork needs to be laid. The year is 1848. Famine has swept Europe only a year prior. Liberalism and socialism are taking root, and the traditional hardline conservative monarchies across the continent are rapidly losing their support. We're only here to talk about France though, and the July monarchy under King Louis Philippe is the one in question. Founded in July of 1830, the July monarchy had lost its popular support after 18 years of rule, and the French people decided it was time to say au revoir to King Louis Philippe, establishing the French Second Republic in February of 1848. The first president that was elected, as fate would have it, was Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, the nephew of the famous Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. In true Bonapartist fashion, Louis Napoleon was both the first and last president of the French Second Republic, establishing the Second French Empire after a generous three-year term as president, naming himself Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte III. For a long while, times were pretty good, but of course, good things never last. For years, France was growing and modernizing. The large streets of Paris were renovated by Eugene Haussmann, being widened so that when unrest would inevitably come, the French army would be easily able to maneuver through the streets, unlike in past revolts. Though times were largely good, people became restless under the suffocating weight of the authoritarian regime. In 1859, things began to change, when a general amnesty for exiled republicans, as in those who wanted a republic, was created to allow them to freely return to France. This liberalization continued when free speech rules were loosened in 1860, and ultimately all this culminated in an increasingly liberal parliament that was not nearly as handicapped as it was when the empire's constitution was first drawn up. As 1870 was coming around, the French empire wasn't looking too hot, and this is the part of every French story where Germany comes into play, and who better to talk about that than Jay Gamer Mapping, native to France's worst nightmare. Take it away, Jay. During this point in history, Prussia had been growing a lot in Europe, and one major reason for this was Otto von Bismarck, scheming Prussia's ways to victories against its enemies. With the French this was especially true. Bismarck knew that in order to officially unify all of the German states into one kingdom, he would have to have them all fight a common enemy, and in this case it would be France. There were plenty of reasons that France did so poorly, so let's go through them all. First of all, Bismarck managed to rile up the French government and people through a complicated series of events just enough so that they would be the ones to be seen as the aggressors, even if they themselves didn't see it that way. This meant that the German states would look to Prussia for defense against the invading French and would all team up under one banner. Second, Prussia had managed to assure that in the case of war between them and France, no one else would join in. Just to name a few key nations that already had issues with France. Britain was already more worried about French militarism than German militarism. Russia was annoyed that France had supported Polish rebels in 1863. Italy, which had previously given a lot of support to France, was sick of the French troops being in Rome, and America was still upset about France's intervention in Mexico. Prussia had essentially gotten assurances from all these countries that they would not join the war, and would just let it be as it is, which meant that, even though Napoleon III was expecting for all of Europe to dogpile onto the Germans, nothing actually happened. The French government was also hoping for the Austrians to come in, because of the fact that Prussia had recently beat Austria in a war. But Prussia had even gotten an assurance from Austria too, partially because Prussia restrained itself from crushing Austria, and let only a few battles decide the war so that the Habsburgs wouldn't be out looking for revenge. Third, the French had severely underestimated the German armies, and overestimated their own. Not only were the troops better trained and more well armed, the Germans also had a more established railroad system to ferry troops to and from the front lines, something the French had little of. What this all meant, in short, was that this war was going to go very very poorly for the French. 
Within only weeks of the war beginning, the French army was routed at the Battle of Sedan, and Napoleon III himself was captured. Paris was put under a terrible siege from September of 1870 until January of 1871. The siege was so long that those who were lucky and rich would be allowed to feast on such delicacies such as cats, dogs, horses, rats and even two famous elephants they had held in their zoo, Castor and Pollux. Needless to say, by the end of the war, Paris was in tatters, physically and morally. A national assembly with a conservative leanings was elected and based out of Versailles, with Adolphe Thiers as its leader, ending the short-lived Second French Empire and beginning the Third French Republic. They negotiated a peace with Germany, ceding them the territory of Alsace-Lorraine, paying them 5 billion francs and officially recognizing Wilhelm I, King of Prussia, as Wilhelm I, Emperor of Germany. Even though Paris had just gone through a horrific siege, with its National Guard being a major player in its defense, Adolphe Thiers became worried of the National Guard. He knew of their more radical tendencies and wanted to see them disbanded and removed from power in Paris, believing they were a threat to the city's stability. March 18, 1871 is when MAD hit the fan. Adolf Thiers was scared of the National Guard in Paris armed with cannons, so the French army was sent in to remove their guns at various locations, totaling at around 400 cannons. Now some of these removals were successful and went off without much of an incident, but the most significant location was at Montmartre, where the largest collection of guns was held, about 170. General Claude Lecomte was in charge of the expedition to take the guns out of Montmartre, but his group of soldiers were met by very angry National Guardsmen and Parisians who refused to let the cannons go. The soldiers were ordered to fire multiple times, but they refused, and some even broke ranks and joined the protesting Parisians. This, along with the fact that necessary horses to move the cannons weren't arriving, spelled disaster for the general. Not much later after that, he was captured, and so was General Jacques-Léon Clement Thomas, who was there in civilian clothes, trying to see what was going on until he was recognized by a soldier who had defected. Clement Thomas was particularly hated by many for how strict he had been as a general during the Siege of Paris the prior year. Not much longer after being captured, he was beaten and shot to death by angry National Guardsmen and deserting soldiers. Soon after, the same fate befell General Lecomte. Clearly seeing this was not a great time to be in Paris, General Vinoy and Adolphe Thiers withdrew to Versailles, which is roughly 12 miles from the center of Paris, so not terribly far away from all the chaos, but far enough that they wouldn't be afraid of being killed instantly. This is pretty much the first day you can say that the Paris Commune had been declared, March 18th. On March 19th, a day after the failed mission to take the cannons at Montmartre, the Central Committee, a committee created only four days prior by the National Guard, met to decide what to do about Adolphe Thiers' government. Some wanted to march on Versailles immediately so they could enforce their demands onto the French government, and they likely could have been successful. The French hadn't yet received all of their soldiers from Germany that had been captured, and France was still reeling as a whole from the Franco-Prussian War. However, the Central Committee ultimately decided to stay and legitimize power in Paris, a decision that may have cost them victory in the revolt and many people their lives. But now is where I spend some time to talk about the inner workings of the Paris Commune. Elections were supposed to be held on the 23rd of March over the leadership of Paris, but a day before them, the Central Committee declared that it was the legitimate government of Paris, usurping the authority of the already established government of Paris. Elections were eventually held on the 26th of March, where a commune council of 92 members, one for every 20,000 Parisians, would be elected. Now, many moderate Republicans wanted nothing to do with this revolutionary government, and the conservatives of Paris definitely didn't want anything to do with this. So that meant that the three most influential beliefs in the Paris Commune were rather radical. There were the Blanquistes, socialists who subscribed to the beliefs of Louis-Auguste Blanqui and wanted aggressive action against Versailles. There were the Proudhonists, anarchists who subscribed to the beliefs of Pierre-Joseph Proudhon and wanted a system of a federation of communes throughout France, without a strong centralized government. Finally, there were the Neo-Jacobins, revolutionaries that wanted to bring the good old days of 1793 back and establish a unitary authoritarian government over all of France. 
Now, I mentioned that there were 92 seats for the Commune Council. In the end, however, only 60 ended up actually taking their seats in the council, as many refused or simply couldn't, such as Blanqui himself, who was serving a prison sentence for the threat he was believed to pose to the French government. He was actually elected the president of the council, but he would never see the commune either begin or end, as he was not released until 1879, eight years later. There were a ton of different plans they had for the Paris Commune, aside from the standard economic equality that socialists of the time pushed. I'll summarize a few of the more significant plans that could be overlooked at first glance. First, they readopted the French Revolution calendar, putting the year at 79. They were also adamant about the separation of church and state, if not the outright removal of church from many functions. They wanted to abolish child labor and also gave employees the right to take over businesses where the owner had fled Paris. There was one liberal reform that they did not plan to undertake though, which was giving women the ability to vote. Women were never allowed to vote in the commune, but they did play an increasingly important role. Support of popular feminist issues at the time was increasing throughout the whole population. These included the right to divorce, equal pay for equal work, the abolition of prostitution, and the right to secular and professional education for women. Louise Michel, dubbed the Red Version of Montmartre, was a symbol of the involvement that women had in the commune. She was later tried and deported to New Caledonia by the French government for her part in the Paris Commune. Back in Versailles, Adolphe Hiftheus was preparing the French troops for a fight against the Paris Commune. He was having troubles getting together enough soldiers to do it though because the French had just finished their war with the newly formed German Empire. So he started to pull from all across the countries and expedited the process of bringing former POVs captured by the Germans into his forces. Under General Patrice McMahon, the French army began skirmishing with the National Guard on the 30th of March, 12 days after the initial attempt to seize the cannons in Paris. The military commission and the executive committee of the commune as well as the National Guard Central Committee, met on April 1st to decide on their own plan. They decided to counterattack sometime within the next five days, but ultimately attacked the very next day on April 2nd. The Communard forces were pushed back and five of them were captured by the French soldiers, two who deserted from the French army and three National Guardsmen. They were shot by the French army, which began their method of shooting any armed resistors on sight, regardless where they came from. The French army kept pushing through the Paris Commune's forces and frequently executed them after a short trial when they were captured. In response to the executions, the Commune decreed that it would start executing the people they held captive if the French government didn't stop. Of course, they didn't stop. Instead, they shortened the times of the military tribunals to only 24 hours in response. One major reason for the French having so much success was because the Paris Commune, even though their numbers were officially at around 200,000 soldiers, were more accurately between 25 to 50,000. There were also soldiers who just were not showing up. And the soldiers that did show up were often led by substandard officers. Officers were elected by the soldiers, which meant it would be more a contest of popularity, not skill. Aside from this, the streets of Paris, which were once extremely difficult to navigate with large numbers of troops, had been widened in many parts by Emperor Napoleon III, starting in 1853. This meant that unlike in previous revolutions where the local Parisians could create narrow barricades and bottleneck the incoming soldiers, the French armies were able to move around freely and were able to maneuver more much easily. Before the French actually had gotten into the city though, one of the most significant and final stands on the outskirts of the city was at Fort Issy where the French government had been putting the area through another brutal siege and an intense battle until they finally broke through. On May 21st, the French army reached the innards of Paris, and this also marks the beginning of Semaine Sanglant, or the Bloody Week. There was death all across the city, with the French army blasting away barricades and fighting with different groups of communist soldiers, which itself caused innumerable deaths. Along with that, military tribunals were still outside the city, taking and executing the Parisian rebels like clockwork, taking anyone that had fired a gun and put them against the wall and shooting them. Inside the commune they pulled one last desperate act and lined up numerous of their own prisoners and had them shot, among them the Archbishop of Paris. The Hotel de Ville, where the commune had been basing most of its government actions, 
was set on fire as a last act of defiance. As the flames raged, men were changing into clothes and shaving their beards, trying to flee the city without being executed by Adolf Hitler's military. By May 28th, the fighting had ended. And when it was all said and done, around 7,500 people were confirmed to have been killed. But the estimates range anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people. The Paris Commune may have only lasted around two months, but the effects it had and the legacy it left were much farther reaching. In its immediate aftermath, other cities across the country also had their own short-lived bouts with creating communes. Lyon lasted two days, Le Creusot three days, Toulouse, three days, Saint-Étienne, four days, Narbonne, five days, and Marseille, which was the most significant follower of Paris, holding out for two weeks with several thousand combatants and around 200 killed in the fighting when the French retook it. The effects of the Paris Commune were even farther reaching than just its immediate vicinity around its birth, and garnered both praise and criticism, often receiving both from the same people. One of the main criticisms by outside observers was about the ludicrous number of executions on both sides. Gustave Flaubert, a French novelist, wrote to George Sand, who was a French Republican involved in the 1848 revolution in France, that, I come from Paris, and I do not know who to speak to. I am suffocated. I am quite upset, or rather out of heart. The sight of the ruins is nothing compared to the great Parisian insanity. With very rare exceptions, Everyone seemed to me only fit for the straitjacket. One half of the population longs to hang the other half, which returns the compliment. That is clearly to be read in the eyes of the passers-by. Within the socialist and communist community, there was a lot of praise for what the Paris Commune did, with many seeing it as the first major step to a worldwide revolution, but was often criticized for not seizing the bank's funds and opting to take loans from it instead. In the following decades, there would be similar uprisings across the world in Moscow, Budapest, Canton, Petrograd, and Shanghai. The Paris Commune's revolt had a clear influence on the Soviet Union throughout its many stages, which is evident with the numerous references to it throughout the years. For example, the title Commissar in the Russian Bolshevik government was directly borrowed from the commissaries of the Commune. The Russian battleship Sevastopol was renamed the Paraskaya Communa. Lenin's mausoleum was originally and currently still is decorated with red banners brought over by French communists in 1924, meant to replicate the ones originally flown by the Paris Commune, and the space capsule Voskhod 1, which carried part of an original communard flag into space. Although it possesses, currently, a very questionable history and legacy, and was even criticized by its contemporaries, what is not questionable is how significant the Paris Commune actually was. Despite only lasting two months, it would go on to bolster the written works of people such as Karl Marx and would remain one of the world's most significant and controversial unrecognized nations. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe to see more, and ring that bell to receive notifications when I upload new videos. If you want to keep up with what's going on with me and my channel, follow my Twitter. If you want to learn more about the Paris Commune, as well as a bunch of other revolutions, check out Mike Duncan's podcast, Revolutions. This isn't sponsored by him, and I highly doubt he's going to watch this video, but he's very talented and does a great job going into depth on these topics. Also, if you want to hear about other nations in history that were not recognized, come over to my channel, where Heinzig and I list our top 10 favorite unrecognized nations. Thank you very much for watching, this has been Historical Hindsight and I'll be seeing you soon.